the Kingdom of France was in turmoil, war with Austria and Prussia, and a cresting tidal wave of political violence at home. Paris was the front line in the war for the future of the revolution. The most recent battle in the political war had taken place on June 20th at the Tuileries, where the sans culottes had intimidated the Legislative Assembly and threatened the personal safety of the royal family. But though the blow had landed, it didn't quite have the effect intended. As we have seen, Louis' stalwart intractability had taken the sting out of the sans culottes punch. Instead of forcing the king to revoke his vetoes, and allow the assembly to prosecute domestic enemies of the revolution, all that June 20th had accomplished was to reawaken fears among the political classes of Paris that the greatest threat to the revolution came not from the king, nor from priests or nobles, but instead from the people. If the sans culottes were bold enough to attempt to impose their will upon the king, then the Girondins knew full well that they too were vulnerable. But they were not about to let some scruffy commoners derail the great revolutionary project, much less the compromise between the people and the king enshrined in the constitution of 1791. A petition, signed by some 20,000 Parisians that decried the excesses of June 20th, indicated that public opinion of the sans culottes was souring. With popular political support assured, the Girondins and the Paris Commune embarked on a bout of conservative backlash against the unrestrained sans culottes. Jérôme Petion had arrived late to the Tuileries on June 20th, claiming not to have received word of the demonstration until late in the day. Now this was either a lie or a gross dereliction of duty, especially considering that Mayor Petion was charged with the defence of the royal family. For his failure, he was removed from office on July 6th by assembly decree. The National Guard, meanwhile, with the Paris Commune's tacit approval, cracked down on the mobs that controlled the streets, but with only middling success. This was not unlike the aftermath of the Champ de Mars massacre. The leaders of the Journée were arrested and imprisoned, or else fled into exile and hiding. That was about all that happened though. Brief and not very effective, the crackdown had petered out by around mid-July. This is largely because the Legislative Assembly was reluctant to ruffle too many feathers among the peacocks that ran the sans culottes So despite their best efforts, the National Guard had wrested control of only a few key areas from the mob. The fear was that should their crackdowns be even a tad too harsh, then at any moment, without warning, the already faltering alliance between the Legislative Assembly and the Commons could shatter with devastating results. Above all, Girondins feared another journée. I mean, who was to say that the mob would not assail the menage as they held on June 20th, but this time en masse, aiming to overthrow the government? This was to say nothing of the fact that attention was now divided between the war and domestic uproar, hampering efforts in both regards. For the Legislative Assembly, the rapidly deteriorating military situation and unrest among Paris's sections was reason enough to officially declare a state of emergency. But to do this, they would have to invoke the law of the country in danger, which would immediately suspend elections, place all government bodies in permanent session, and allow for much of the constitution to be legally circumvented. So too would a state of emergency permit the Legislative Assembly to act with relative impunity and without the sanction of the king. Of course, the once staunchly absolutist royal ministry, the last vestige of the conservative Fouillon, would have a thing or two to say about that. Before a state of emergency could be declared, it became necessary to remove the royal ministry as an obstacle to invoking the law. In this capacity, the Legislative Assembly was ruthless and extremely effective. Each and every one of the King's sycophantic ministers was singled out and raked through the mud by the propagandists. The Jacobins were of particular use here, using their connections to the leftist press to tar and feather the ministers. Particular attention was drawn to their credentials as thoroughly disgraced Fouillon, that same faction which had perpetrated the odious Champ de Mars massacre and the subsequent head-smashing crackdown. With a crisis of legitimacy brewing, many of the high-profile ministers simply up and left, resigning their posts on July 10th. On that same day, most of the remaining ministers resigned as well. Only a skeletal outline remained of the once proud royal ministry, and it would remain impotent right up until its dissolution. With no royal ministry to balance them out, the Legislative Assembly gleefully snatched up emergency powers, invoking the country in danger on July 11th. With their emergency powers, the Assembly made a number of fateful decisions. Bowing to public pressure, and to get a Girondin back in the mayor's office, the wildly popular Petion was reinstated on July 13th. Back at the helm, Petion ordered the National Guard to be substantially expanded, an act of desperation born of the need for more men to hold back the tide of the sans culottes. All citizens who owned a pike or a musket were to be drafted into the National Guard. This sudden influx of common Parisians triggered a seismic demographic shift within the National Guard, seriously undermining the Guard's bourgeois core. It was bad timing for the Girondins. As we saw on June 20th, the National Guard was already riven by internal divide, 
with many openly siding with the revolutionaries and republicans, and others still supporting the constitution and the legislative assembly to the hilt. So from here on, it's perhaps necessary to make a distinction between the National Guard, the core of the Guard still loyal to the constitution and the government, and the Revolutionary Guard, those who were conditionally loyal but whose true sympathies lay with the sans culottes from whose ranks they were disproportionately drawn. These draftees were begrudgingly admitted by the Commune, but they themselves were happy to join because membership brought with it the right to vote. And this had a further effect, one that would become more prevalent in the coming months. By admitting sans culottes and commoners, the active passive distinction was eroded in a very concrete way. The voting bloc that was the National Guard would become less and less homogenous, shifting instead to favour more radical, outspoken revolutionaries in line with the view of the people of Paris. Division within the National Guard was only exacerbated by the King's vetoing of the entry of the Federes into Paris, done in support of the middle class backbone of the Guard over their concerns with guarding Federes. As the fate drew near, and tens of thousands of Federes lingered on the outskirts of Paris, the Legislative Assembly faced a conundrum. Admit the Federes and piss off the Guard, or send them away and piss off the sans culottes In part to forestall a riot, and also as a middle finger to Louis, the Assembly chose quite simply to ignore the King's veto. So before long, the Federes poured into Paris. With the influx of out-of-towners, mostly Federes yes, but also departmental National Guard units, this year's fate was set to be a particularly well-attended one. And for this momentous occasion, no expense was spared. The Paris Commune, whose job it was to organise the festivities, followed the orders of the Legislative Assembly to heavily militarise the celebration and centre festivities around patriotism, revolutionary fervour and communal spirit. The hope was to drive up recruitment for the army, perennially short of men and lacking motivated recruits. Thus, the Champ de Mars was occupied by 83 army tents, one for each department. Recruiters decked in tricolour sashes signed up droves of eager young men. To the colours did these young lads flock, eager to serve not only their country, but also the revolution. It's really here we start to see how clearly intermingled patriotism and revolutionary zeal had become. The marriage of these two ideals was becoming a key feature of revolutionary imagery and rhetoric. To hammer home the message of service and patriotism, a memorial was erected, tricolour raised high above it, and dedicated to the soldiers who had perished in the fighting. Huge seating structures had been set up around the interior of the field, near the tents, enclosing a raised platform called the Altar of the Nation, from where speeches and announcements were made. Further out was the eclectic assemblage of carriages and makeshift stands, used by onlookers to gain a vantage point over the crowds of many thousands. Trees played a prominent role in the fate symbolism. A poplar tree was planted by each of the department's tents, draped in red, blue and white ribbons. But dominating the field was the largest tree of all, the symbolic heart of the fate. The Tree of Feudalism, as it was called, was festooned with the imagery and symbols of the Ancien Regime and the Catholic Church. Clerical robes, crowns, jewellery, noble titles, and even the keys of St. Peter. The plan was to set the tree aflame, representing the eradication of feudalism in France. But that was to come later. For now, Louis, the Queen, Elizabeth, and the young Dauphin watched on from their vantage point atop the balcony of the Ecole Militaire, as a triumphal parade opened the fate. The National Guard and several regular army units marched past first, in perfect formation, to be followed by a mixed procession of energetic federates and cockaded Parisians. A model of the Bastille had been built, and was prominently displayed too, held aloft by eager demonstrators. Delegates from the Legislative Assembly brought up the rear, receiving more jeers than they did cheers. Louis watched on unenthused. And by some accounts, Marie Antoinette wept during the parade, in full view of the crowd. Not a good look for the Austrian Queen. She was still worry-stricken over her family's most recent brush with the mob, and genuinely feared for Louis's life. She went so far as to prepare for a potential assassination attempt, and thus had outfitted her husband in a custom-made doublet. Thickly padded, it would only be put to use if a would-be assassin could pass through Louis's personal guard, now enlarged to several soldiers who escorted Louis in public. Once the parade was over, these guards guided Louis through the mob. From her perch atop the balcony, and with the use of a spyglass, Marie Antoinette watched on helplessly as the crowd crushed the royal entourage with sheer mass and weight of numbers. Having barely managed to force a path to the altar, she screamed in horror when the king fumbled at the first step, at which point the crowd surged forward, pinning him and his guard against the wooden platform. But by some miracle, fat little Louis extricated himself from the dog pile and took to the altar, remaining, at least outwardly, calm and composed. Reiterating his oath to the people and the nation was not something Louis would have relished doing. But as much as he hated it, what came next he hated even more. It was demanded of him by the organisers of the fate 
that he be the one to set fire to the bundles of sticks and kindling that stood at the base of the tree of feudalism. The conflagration would burn away those physical representations of the Ancien Regime, and how potent an image it would be for the king himself to spark the flame. Well, Louis, uncharacteristically, refused the order. And it was an order. Before he might be compelled to start the fire, Louis slinked back to the École Militaire, much to the annoyance of the organisers. Very publicly, and very convincingly, Louis had refused to break with the old ways of the Ancien Regime. Whatever fiasco the king's refusal might have caused was soon overshadowed by bigger events in Paris. Military reversals were coming thick and fast, and the fate wasn't enough to distract public attention away from the looming spectre of invasion and defeat. In this climate of fear and uncertainty, enemies of the constitutional order sprung up all over the place. A new threat emerged from within the assembly itself, where the ascendant Girondins were savagely struck by a well-orchestrated Jacobin revolt. Now the seeds of this conflict were sown earlier in the year, planted by Brissot as he paved the path to war, dragging with him a majority of the Jacobins. This culminated in a vote in favour of war, with only seven voting against. It was Robespierre and a hapless few diehards who refused to countenance Brissot's war. But for their conviction, they were dealt a humiliating political defeat, which simultaneously bifurcated the Jacobin club and imperiled their brand of radical, but domestically oriented, revolutionary politics. Shrewdly, Robespierre had laid low once the war began, low enough to evade reprisal from Brissot and the Girondins, and to avoid too much bad publicity for what the press would eagerly have misconstrued as cowardice on his part. Robespierre took this downtime to reform the club, and in so doing, he very explicitly positioned himself as the linchpin. He also made damn sure that the Jacobins were still viewed as an indispensable friend of the people, largely through use of the highly developed propaganda network headed by Jean-Paul Marat. Perhaps most importantly of all, Robespierre allied the Jacobin club to the sections. He also ingratiated the club to the highly influential and extremely popular arch-revolutionary Georges Danton, who by now would return from exile and re-established himself as the ideological head of the sans culottes And this really was the beginning of a personal relationship between Danton and Robespierre that was to become so influential in the course of the revolution. But this relationship was give and take. Irrevocably, the Jacobin club was bound to Danton's radicalism and that of the sans culottes and thus, come what may, Robespierre had hitched the Jacobin horse to a cause that, as we have seen, is extremely agitated and quite likely to bolt off in God knows what direction. Would the move pay off? That was the question. Climbing this mountain was no easy task, but Robespierre, single-minded and relentless, was just the man the Jacobins needed. Nonetheless, he was aided along the way. The poor opening phase of the campaign in Flanders was a fortuitous windfall by which many Girondins were disabused of the myth of a short, sharp war. These disillusioned delegates were induced to return to the Jacobin fold at Robespierre's behest. But still he bided his time, waiting in the shadows for an opportunity to strike out at Brissot, his ally turned rival. And that opportunity arrived on July 23rd. Robespierre shot back onto the political stage with a public denunciation of the king and the constitution, calling for both to be destroyed. The Jacobins had struck the perfect political chord. Their decree hummed in tune with public opinion, a siren song that signaled to all radicals that the Jacobin club was the true champion of the people and of the revolution. Brissot was caught with his pants down, unprepared to fight on yet another front in his war against political enemies in Paris, as well as defend France in a very real war that could soon reach the capital itself. Seeing few options, the Girondins engaged Louis directly in secret negotiations on just how the constitution and the monarchy could be safeguarded. The royal ministry might have been some help here, being as they were perhaps the only other political institution in the country that was loyal to both the king and the constitution. But what help could a decapitated royal ministry really offer after the Girondins had so thoroughly crushed them? Though existing as the sole institutional pillar of national government had allowed the Girondins to quickly gobble up power, they were now weathering the storm alone. So with the assembly distracted and the institutional power vacuum left empty by the royal ministry, an opportunity emerged for the people to fill the void. So into the political limelight came the sectional assemblies, united in their hatred of the active, passive distinction. By the stipulations of the country in danger, these assemblies sat in permanent session, and therefore, and therefore, were perpetually engaged in the business of administration and politics. Essentially overnight, these amorphous, loose affiliations became far more organized and effective. At Danton's suggestion, the sectional assemblies began to unilaterally ignore the active-passive distinction, and thus their membership spiked sharply, as thousands of otherwise passive citizens were admitted into the roles. Danton went further and attempted to leverage his position as a unifying figure to institute an overarching committee that would align all the various sectional assemblies. While he was only partly successful, 
Most of the more moderate assemblies in more affluent districts of Paris declined entry, partly to preserve their independence and partly to appease their generally more moderate, more middle-class members. But the poorer assemblies, they had no such qualms. And now, with booming membership, happily they went along with Danton's plan. This coordinating committee, representative of only the most radical and hardcore of all the sections, first sat on July 23rd in the Hôtel de Ville, just as Robespierre was making his bombastic return to relevance. And the timing's no coincidence. The committee effectively coordinated the sectional assemblies, their allies, and their affiliates as well as aligned political clubs, and chiefly that meant Robespierre's Jacobins. All their aims were now unified. And of course, that meant the aims of Danton were front and centre, because let's not forget that Danton is not only Paris's most infamous revolutionary terrier, but also a political animal. The sectional assemblies coalesced around his direction and his leadership. From the Hôtel de Ville, the coordinating committee operated as a parallel authority, holding de facto control of the sections of Paris controlled by the sans culottes Though the Paris Commune was still technically in charge, they could only act in areas the National Guard protected directly. In other words, the sans culot had established an institution which existed in parallel and in conflict with France's only other powerful governing institution, the waning Legislative Assembly. The momentum of the revolution had now decisively shifted away from the political and middle classes. It was now firmly in the hands of the lower orders, in the hands of the radical sans culot. So, widespread political violence in Paris and throughout the kingdom. The French offensive crushed before it ever really got going, and enemies threatening to invade any day soon. Conspiracies, real and imagined, peddled in propagandistic press, and rumour that mired all of French society in scandal and mutual distrust. A royal family, despised by the people, and a king fundamentally unequipped to meet the challenges of the moment. A campaign of sustained, systemic destruction, diminishment or subjugation of France's ancient institutions. The church, the crown, the ministries, the aristocracy. A campaign started by the National Assembly and then continued by the far more radical Legislative Assembly. The coordinating committee fit into this larger revolutionary picture as the final piece in a mosaic that depicted doom for the monarchy and for the constitution of 1791. The precariously balanced House of Cards was crashing down around the heads of the Girondins, around Brousseau. Is it any surprise to you then? just what the coordinating committee discussed in hushed tones and unequivocal terms. Is it any wonder that their chief ideologue Danton was advocating for a coup against the government, for treason against the king? The revolution was emanating from below, from the most downtrodden and desperate, from the most politically and economically disenfranchised orders in Paris. As we've seen, this was a revolutionary pot that had boiled over time and time again, but only to simmer down and then boil over again in a repeating cycle. But the cumulative effects of widespread impoverishment, joblessness, disillusionment, and plenty of free time had provided all the necessary prerequisites for the radicalization of the Parisians. And as the coordinating committee met, one word was on the lips of every revolutionary, either in the Hôtel de Ville or demonstrating out on the street. Republic. A cure-all to what ails France. A republic, to oust the king, his corrupted ministers and advisers, and rebuild the country on revolutionary principles. To elevate all those citizens that would spread and carry forth the revolution, braving the bayonet for the benefit of their fellow citizen. To institute a government that will avoid malaise, infighting and inaction. A government in which all citizens had a part to play, firmly rooted in the general will, beholden to the citizen voter. How much longer could the Legislative Assembly, much less the King, hold out against the popular, revolutionary, now Republican forces arrayed against them? Not only could the committee rely upon the support of the radical sections of Paris, but also the multitudes of federés that had lingered in the city and its surrounds after the fate. Trained and motivated revolutionary guard units were among these out-of-towners, and they offered their services to the committee. And it was the legendary Marseille Guard Company that emblemized these revolutionary guards. Proud, extremely devoted, and unflinchingly courageous. Suffice to say, Paris was one great big powder cake, and it would only take the faintest spark to set the whole thing off. And that spark came on July 28th, less than a week after the coordinating committee first sat. Striking the match was one of the last members of the aristocracy left in France, our old friend and the architect of the escape from the Tuileries and the flight to Varennes, Hans Axel, Count von Fersen. For months, Axel had been at the heart of a shadowy conspiracy led by himself to induce the fall of the Legislative Assembly and the reassertion of the monarchy. Axel and fellow nobles, chiefly the Marquis de Lamont, took advantage of the disarray government decrying the Legislative Assembly's weak response to the storming of the Tuileries and its degradation of the King. Now this would be alarming on its own, 
A couple of nobles feeling bold enough to publicly denounce the assembly was indicative of just how low the assembly itself had fallen. But what made the manifesto truly scandalous was that it had the backing of the Prussians. Axel had corresponded with foreign officers, reporting on the fragile state of French politics, requesting that military intervention come sooner rather than later. The Duke of Brunswick, in command of the Austrian and Prussian armies poised to invade France, had responded positively. In a decree made public and read in every square, cafe and hall in Paris, Brunswick pledged his support for the Bourbons and threatened to kill any and all who threatened his advance on Paris. And this included the National Guard, whom he singled out, threatening not just to execute them if they resisted, but to demolish their homes too. The Brunswick Decree, as it was later known, was instrumental in unifying the war aims of the First Coalition. Jointly, Prussia and Austria issued a manifesto via the Duke of Brunswick that stated in explicit terms that the Legislative Assembly and the Revolution at large would be compelled to desist in the persecution of the First and Second Estates. Furthermore, they were to relinquish the reins of government back to Louis. Not a hair on the king's head was to be harmed, or else. Right when the saint culottes were coordinating, right when the king was utterly reviled, right when the Legislative Assembly was plugging holes left and right on their sinking constitutional ship, well, that's when the Brunswick Decree hit Paris, right into the heart of that seething, roiling milieu of radicalism and patriotism. The decree backfired spectacularly. It was the spark for our powder cake. The Legislative Assembly interpreted the decrees as a direct military threat to Paris, and so wasted no time in strengthening defences. Every man was desperately needed, and so on July 30th, they quickly redefined the prerequisites for service in the National Guard yet again, expanding it out to include passive citizens. Of course, as it happened a few weeks back, the Commune had permitted many passive citizens to enter the Guard, thoroughly undermining the active-passive distinction. Well, this most recent decree was really just a moratorium on requirements for service in the Guard, and thousands of sans culottes willingly joined, eager to nab the voting rights that came with entry, but also to protect Paris. But even with a greater common enemy, factions in Paris continued to edge their own internal war. The Girondins had led the Legislative Assembly into this war, and now scrambled not only to defend Paris from without, but to defend the constitution of the king from the uppity saint culottes and federates within. The Coordinating Committee was an existential threat, though the Girondins didn't know that at the time. But Mayor Petion was under no such illusion, and saw the writing on the wall. Time had come to abandon ship, so he leveraged his good standing among Parisians to transition elegantly away from support for the constitutional order, and into outspoken support for the Coordinating Committee's project. On August 3rd, he publicly broke with the Girondins, issuing a declaration calling for Louis' abdication. Though Petion stopped short of advocating for a republic, it was clear that that's the direction he, and by extension the Paris Commune, were leaning. Though the Commune was opposed to the saint culottes and their brand of violent, street-to-street -street revolution, they were no friend of the king either. And besides which, the saint culottes had the upper hand. So if he can't beat him, join him. Arguably, the Commune's defection was a fatal blow for the Girondins because it forced them to double down on their defense of the constitutional order, and thus, of its unpopular king. It's not inconceivable, however unlikely, that at this late stage, Brissot leads the Girondins to split from the monarchy, cutting the king loose. But the Girondins were Brissot's people. Where he went, they went. And he believed that too much stock had been placed in the king to cut him loose. So the Girondins redoubled their already doubled efforts to salvage the ship of state, rebuking the Republican Jacobins. And within the menage, they were fairly successful. Most moderate delegates feared the saint culottes and what populist upheaval a republic might trigger. But public opinion swung the other way. Thus, the Girondins were under immense pressure from below to follow the commune and advocate for immediate abdication. Exerting a great deal of this pressure was the Bon Concile, one of the most radical sectional assemblies, which on August 5th voted to officially no longer recognize the authority of the king. Simultaneously, another radical section, the Coins Va, were making their own preparations for an armed demonstration. Following their example, several other committees joined, all vowing to march on the menage to force the abdication through the Legislative Assembly. It was only through the timely intercession of Mayor Petion, in his capacity as a newly acquired ally for the sections, that a violent showdown was averted. He managed to convince several sections to hold off until the Assembly themselves could draft the decree demanding abdication without being coerced. But unfortunately for Petion, he only had so much sway over the radicals. And now they had a mind to force the issue themselves, with or without the Legislative Assembly. Independently, thousands of sectionaires descended upon the Champ de Mars the next day. Anti-monarchical sentiment was the order of the day, with popular Republican songs and chants decrying Louis heard throughout the entire field. But even still, the Assembly didn't come down decisively in favour of the sections, 
nor did they outright side with the king. Instead, they vacillated, and as it turned out, for too long. Things came to a crescendo when, on August 9th, a draft proposal hit the floor of the menage, calling for Louis's abdication. The delegates spent the day debating the issue, but came to no conclusion. And this was quite intentional. Brousseau wanted the Girondins to debate the issue, but not come to a conclusion, playing for time until the mood on the streets cooled down, or until an alternative could be found. But sometimes indecision is worse than a bad decision, and this is one of those times. The Girondins' final gamble played like bureaucratic lethargy and institutional backsliding. In such a rapidly developing political crisis, the question of Louis' abdication needed a firm answer, and it needed it now. If the Legislative Assembly could not or would not provide that definitive answer, well then, then the Coordinating Committee was more than happy to oblige the people of France with that answer themselves. The iron was hot, it was time to strike. The night of August 9th was a flurry of activity. To begin, the delegations of various sections and federate groups convened at the Hôtel de Ville. No time is lost in stating their aims. They declared that Paris was officially under committee control. To this end, they established the Insurrectionary Commune, there to provide a provisional city government until the abdication crisis was resolved to the sans culottes satisfaction. Tocks and bells atop the Hôtel were rung in the early hours of the morning, signalling to the sections that their insurrection had begun. But of course, what would the actual city government, the Paris Commune, have to say about this? Ostensibly, Petion had allied the Commune to the committee. Was that brief union already over? Um, yeah, yeah it was. From the Hôtel de Ville, the committee ordered the National Guard to come under their immediate control, stripping the Commune of its only means of forcing a stop to the nascent revolt. And for the most part, the Guard complied, being as they were, heavily populated by sans culottes and revolutionary sympathisers. Not all of the companies complied though, and neither did their commander, Mandat de Concy. When he was notified of these mass defections, he immediately ordered his loyal units to blockade the various bridges across the Seine. The Pont Neuf, the Pont Royal, the Pont Rouge, and the Pont de Notre Dame were all cordoned off. His hope was that this move would smother the insurrection in its crib by preventing the saint culottes from the southern sections from crossing the Seine to join their northern comrades. Grossi then rushed to the Tuileries to warn the king and the royal household of the impending threat. Once arrived, he found feverish defensive preparations already underway. It was still early morning, the sun near to rising, when the guard captain received word that the insurrectionary committee demanded his presence at the Hôtel de Ville. Just why was it that a portion of the National Guard refused to accept the committee's orders, and why were the bridges across the Seine impassable? He had some explaining to do. Now, at this early stage, the full extent of the insurrection was not yet known. And indeed, the committee had not yet gone on the offensive, holding the sans back for an opportune moment to strike. So Gonossi had no idea that he was walking into the lion's den when he accepted the committee's demands and presented himself at the Hôtel de Ville. The peaceable compromise he hoped to achieve never materialised. On the contrary, Danton dived into a particularly acerbic denunciation of the guard captain, who was promptly arrested. Clearly he was an agent of the Crown and not loyal to the citizens of Paris. Grossi was not to make it to trial. As he was led away in fetters, a nearby saint culot fired a pistol at point-blank range. The shot struck Grossi in the head, killing him instantly. With the position of guard captain, shall we say expeditiously vacated, saint took effective command. His first move was to order that Mayor Petion be placed under house arrest, worried that he might again intercede on the Assembly's behalf for a second time. Whilst the Paris Commune was dealt its coup de main, the Insurrectionary Committee's eclectic assemblage of lawyers, writers, popular ideologues and propagandists determined that their next move was to utilise the element of surprise and pounce on the remnant vestiges of the monarchy. So under cover of lamplight, members and leaders were sent scurrying across Paris to confer with their colleagues, pre-positioned guard companies, array the sans culottes, and to hand the Federés their marching orders. Within a few hours, everyone was prepared. The insurrection was ready to destroy the enemies of the revolution. It speaks to just how thorough the preparatory groundwork had been that all of this had been accomplished at the drop of a hat literally overnight, without the authorities being any the wiser. Danton and Robespierre made a good team, a bit of a revolutionary power couple. Dawn broke, and the attack began. Scarcely had the sun begun to warm the capital, when the streets of Paris began to shudder with a footfall of over 20,000 armed sans culottes. Federés intermingled with their Parisian counterparts, and guard companies from the departments marched in time with their precise cadence drumming. Some 400 Marseille led the main column, which had departed the Hôtel de Ville not long after dawn. As they went, the sans culottes worked the city with their shouting, their songs and chanting. Oyam citoyen, to armed citizens was a common refrain 
a line taken from a song popularised by the Marseillais, a song from this day henceforth which would bear their name. Many Parisians roused from sleep joined the insurrection, lending their voices and their strength to the cause. Insurrectionary leaders Danton, Santerre and Desmoulins were found at the forward edge of the columns, exhorting the bravery of the Mass de saint culot Passage across the various bridges was a bit tricky and took several hours. But generally the guardsmen were talked down and joined the insurrection. By around mid-morning, tens of thousands of saint culot Federés, defectors, soldiers and guardsmen were coalesced in the Place de Carousel, just a stone's throw from the Tuileries. The scene was very reminiscent of the June Journée, and indeed from a certain vantage point at the second story window, Louis surveyed a scene eerily familiar to him. Dejected and pessimistic, the king watched on as the streets began to swell with tens of thousands. Below him, in the gardens and the grounds and the halls of the Tuileries, were around 2,000 National Guards. But of course, these men were of dubious loyalty. Even as the crowds continued to gather on the outskirts, guards could be seen conversing with their revolutionary comrades through the exterior fence. Truth is, the guard was there more to keep the king contained rather than to defend the Tuileries. For that, Louis placed his trust in 900 Royal Swiss Guard, professional soldiers of proven metal who we last saw defending the Bastille. Word of the death of Guard Captain de Concy was as yet unconfirmed, but even still it was clear that the National Guard was wavering. So on the recommendation of his advisers, Louis descended down into the gardens to inspect the National Guard. The idea was that his presence would inspire the men and instill in them the resolve to fight bravely should the unthinkable happen, and the mob attempt to force entry into the grounds. But whatever hope existed that the presence of the king might inspire his men was betrayed by Louis's appearance. It was not Louis XVI, king of the French, latest in a long line of prestigious Bourbons, who appeared before the assembled guardsmen. It was instead the dregs of that once proud dynasty. A shriveled husk of a man, his face unduly aged by the myriad stresses of three years of revolution. A simple purple coat, was all that indicated Louis's royal pedigree. He no longer wore a crown or any royal accoutrement and instead dressed as a nobleman. He hadn't even had time to fully prepare his makeup for the inspection and thus his white wig sat atop his head awkwardly, only haphazardly powdered. But he had made a point not to wear the same padded doublet he had worn for his own protection during the Fete de l'Effetation. Against the wishes of the Queen, Louis categorically refused to wear the doublet, claiming it would be cowardly to wear such a garment in the presence of men whose job it was to protect him. Arrayed for inspection, the guard was restless. While some men stood proudly at attention while Louis shuffled past, others milled about lazily, unstirred. Many more lingered at the edges of the grounds, the only line of defence between the king and the insurrectionaries. Leading Louis was an officer of the guard who had a better sense of just how bad things were going than pretty well anyone else. So he began to beseech the king to end the review early and seek refuge outside of the Tuileries with a regular army battalion encamped on the Pont au Nantes, not far from the Jardin du Roy. Agreeing with the officer, Louis made to leave quickly and quietly. But the soldiers at the Tournant themselves had no intention of sheltering their king, and instead they disembarked their camp and joined in with the fiery saint culot and the Place du Carousel. Louis watched on with his trademark sullen despondency as several of the cannons around the Pont Tournant were turned around to face the Tuileries. The gun crews sauntered up to the king to give him a piece of their mind. Sharp scuffles occurred soon thereafter as the gun crews were disarmed and dispersed where Louis slinked back to the relative safety of the palace. The rallying effect Louis and his advisers had hoped to achieve by the inspection had obviously not materialised. The king's defence depended now on unreliable guardsmen, dissentious soldiers and foreign mercenaries. Things were looking bleak. Louis and his family resigned themselves to inaction, whilst various ministers and advisers attached to the king scrambled for a solution, clinging to various schemes and notions that might avert disaster. Out of this last minute planning came a desperate plea issued from Louis himself to the Legislative Assembly. He called for a delegation to be sent at once. Out of options, the King was throwing himself at their mercy. And it was not an unreasonable hope that a delegation might be good enough to placate the masses long enough for a peaceable solution to be reached. By the time the King's desperate plea reached the Legislative Assembly, their daily session was well underway. And here, once again, innovation and inaction spelt disaster for the ailing Assembly. Debates began over just how to respond, but no answer was found. Though the Girondins were in favour of meeting the King's request, the reinvigorated Jacobins held the line, blockading the proposal. Responsibility fell to the Procurator General of the Department of Paris, a guy named Pierre Roderer. Having caught wind of the King's situation, and on his own initiative, Roderer unilaterally decided to engage the King on behalf of the Assembly. His arrival at the Tuileries was met with muted relief by the King and his ministers, 
Finally, a government representative had appeared. But Rotoro didn't offer to rescue the king outright. Instead, he described in stark terms how the guards and the mob were mingling, how the sentries were abandoning their posts, how the Marseillais and the radical sectionaires were whipping up the crowds into a fever pitch. Rotoro was a realist, not prone to sugarcoating. The only way to avoid a showdown, he claimed, was to flee, immediately, for the relative safety of the menage. There, at least, the legislative assembly could ensure some measure of safety. Even before Louis had a chance to digest this news, the Queen launched into a barbed denunciation of Rotoraire's ultimatum. To treat with an assembly which had so gravely damaged the reputation and station of the King, to seek their protection was an act of cowardice and desperation that Marie Antoinette would not consider. In her own words, she would rather be nailed to the walls of the palace. While the Queen's passions ran high, Rotoraire's did not. He used no couch language or insinuations. Calmly, he recalled the Queen's obligations to her family. You endanger the lives of your children and husband. Think of the responsibility you take upon yourself. Marie Antoinette's 11th hour line in the sand might seem a bit rich in hindsight, but can you really blame her? She had braved armed crowds several times before and suffered outrageous tabloid smear campaigns. Certainly the Queen had more balls than she's given credit for. Through it all, from the moment she had been literally dumped on the French border at the age of 15, to her position now, besieged in the Tuileries, she could at least say that she had held her head high. What else could she do but resist to this final humiliation? Rederer's remarks, therefore, fell upon deaf ears. Soon all pretense of courtly etiquette and decorum vanished, as a vicious back-and-forth argument erupted between Rederer and those who supported the Queen in her desire to remain put. Louis took a little active role doing his usual thing of going along with whoever spoke the loudest or spoke to him last. In the end, cooler heads prevailed, and Roderer's point won out. With a word, the king ended the debate. Marchand, he said. The royal family would seek refuge under the wing of the legislative assembly. As the royal entourage filed into the court of the Fouillon, ranks of Swiss guard trailed behind. Roderer recalled in his memoirs how Louis made an offhand comment about the preponderance of orange leaves that had fallen with this year's early onset of autumn. But chaos soon ensued as dozens of noblemen all rushed out from the Tuileries apartments to convince the king to remain at the palace. But Louis had made his choice, and he and his family would be escorted to the assembly. Some nobles offered to go with him, but they were rebuffed. And all the while more and more people crowded around the royal entourage, slowing progress to a crawl. Ironically enough, Louis's most ardent allies were now a physical danger. In Rotorer's recollection, a piercing shriek was emitted by the queen as she saw her young son picked up by a guardsman. But had the guardsman not picked up the young prince, word travelled fast and reached the legislative assembly that the king would soon arrive. The Girondins ceased their vacillations immediately and issued a positive reply. Virginaud, Brissot and other Girondins declared forthwith that they would rather perish at the hands of the mob than deny the safety of the royal family. The constitutional order was making a final stand. Around 9 o'clock in the morning, the royal entourage trundled up to the menage, Rotorer in tow. As Louis approached the wide steps leading into the hall, followed, it seems, by half the population of the Tuileries, guardsmen appeared before him to bar entry. Not hanging on ceremony, the guardsmen asked that Louis and his family enter alone, and for the rest of the nobles to bugger off. Offering no protest, Louis assented, and the royal family entered unescorted. Rotorer, as a government official, was permitted to enter also. Once inside, the king was met by several delegates. He delivered himself into their custody with his customary eloquence, stating, I cannot be safer than in your midst. And indeed, President Virginaud and other Girondins eagerly offered their promises of safety and protection. But the warm welcome was short-lived. Louis had pretensions of overseeing the day's debates and took a seat beside Virginaud. At this, a radical delegate took great offence, believing the king's presence would influence the debates. So Louis was compelled to take his family and quite literally hide away in a small anteroom separated from the main hall by a few iron bars. In case the royal family should need to make a quick escape, Louis and a few others rolled up their sleeves and removed the bars. Then they sat in stifled silence as the debates carried on without them. In the words of one Jacobin delegate, they bowed their heads like whipped dogs. Back at the Tuileries, violence seemed unavoidable. Scuffles between the palace defenders and the surging sans culottes were becoming more and more frequent. But by some miracle, wholesale violence had been avoided so far. All throughout the Jardin du Roy, on the southwestern side of the Tuileries, and in the Place du Carousel, on the north, the sans rolled forwards with their irresistible mass. The occasional gunshot echoed out, but was generally fired on accident, or as a warning to the crowds to keep their distance. Nonetheless, the exhortations of Demolin and Danton kept the mob's blood up, and they were ever ready for action. 
and by around 10 or 11 o'clock, the inevitable happened. Now, according to the account of the guard captain of the Finisterre Federace, the Marseille vanguard forced their way up to the Tuileries front steps, backed by the Finisterre. At least initially, they were cordial enough with the Swiss guards who stood watch at the steps. But tensions rose when the Marseille voiced their intentions to enter, and that the Swiss would have to relinquish their weapons. Then, from among the defenders emerged an officer of the National Guard, who agreed to parley. As he descended the steps, a Marseille rushed forward and bayoneted the officer. Before he was attacked again, the officer managed to escape back behind the Swiss guard, clutching a nasty wound. Guardsmen surged forward, a phalanx of bayonets between themselves and the Marseillais. A gunshot was then fired in warning. In the ensuing confusion, the Swiss and the Marseille mixed together, and scuffles broke out. Some Swiss officer attempted to defuse the situation, but he absolutely refused to relinquish his arms without express orders from the king. His refusal was met with immediate threats of violence. Nonetheless, the officer stuck to his gun, so to speak, and stated that he and his men were prepared to die if necessary. And it wasn't long before he had a chance to prove that these weren't empty words. After refusing to disarm, he too was attacked, pulling back with his arms sliced up by a saber. This was the final straw. The officer stood beside his men and gave the order to fire. There is, however, an alternative narrative from more reliable sources about just how fighting broke out at the Tuileries. Eyewitnesses reported that around 10 or 11 o'clock, a goodly portion of the National Guardsmen defending the Corps de Tuileries were enticed to defect and join the insurrection. So they opened the gates of the court and filed out into the streets just as the crowds rushed in. Somewhere in this confusing, mashed intermingling of the insurrectionaries and the defectors, a rumour emerged that this was more than merely a defection, but this was the full-blown surrender of the palace. Thus, having occupied the courtyard, the sans culottes were shocked to find that the Swiss Guard were not surrendering, but were instead holding firm. Holding the palace walls, the Swiss opened fire into the crowd. Were they ordered to? Did the sans culottes fire first? To be honest, it doesn't really matter. The result was similarly tragic. The first line of the Marseille were rapidly mown down by the merciless fire of the disciplined Swiss. Then the front rank, having discharged their muskets, ran forward into the courtyard as the Marseille routed. More gunfire, the flash of a bayonet, screams of agony. The cannons left by the disloyal artillerymen in the courtyard were remanned by the Swiss and turned around to face the protesters. Cannon blasting point blank, let fly cannonballs that ripped apart the dense masses of sans culottes as they fled out onto the Place du Carousel. Word of these escalating tensions trickled back to Louis, back at the Menage. In response, Louis issued an order not to open fire. This was not a conditional fire if fired upon order, but a blanket order not to fire. Problem was, by the time the order was issued and conveyed to the Tuileries, it was already too late. Perhaps if it reached the Tuileries sometime earlier, it might have been excuse enough for the Swiss to disarm, their honour intact. But as it was, Louis' order only reached them now, hours later, right as they were firing their cannons and muskets as quickly as humanly possible, letting loose ripples of well-aimed fire into the crowd. Louis' order was received by the commander of the Swiss Guard, Karl Joseph Bachmann. His response was to immediately recall the troops from the courtyard and concentrate them with the garrison defending the Tuileries itself. This brief respite from the onslaught of fire offered the sans culottes and the Federates just enough time to rally. In the minds of those who had just now narrowly escaped death at the hands of the King's Guard, well, there was only one explanation. They were enemies of the people, given the orders to fire by a traitor king. Though hundreds of their revolutionary brothers and sisters were strewn all across the courtyard and surrounding streets, dead or dying, the insurrectionaries were undeterred. Brave beyond reasoning, the Marseillais led the charge, and I do mean charge. A single massed wave of sword swinging, banner waving, shouting and rampaging sans culottes rushed headlong back into the Tuileries courtyard. Simultaneously, other assaults were occurring from the direction of the Jardin du Roy. For hours, a back and forth tug of war ensued, with the sans culottes making hard won gains, only to be repulsed by the heavy, precise fire of the Swiss. And everywhere, people died in droves. Some citizens attempted to pull back the wounded away from the danger. Others ferried ammunition, water and food to the sans culottes at the front line. The whole scene hung heavy with plumes of smoke from raging fires and the discharge of cannon and musket. From the menage, the crackles of musket and cannon fire could clearly be heard emanating from the palace. The legislative assembly's worst fear was coming true. Clearly, Louis's orders had not reached the palace, but worse yet, they'd been ignored. For his own part, the king claimed to have done all he could to avoid violence, between his departure from the Tuileries and subsequent order not to fire. 
But things were now in motion that could not be undone. Things far more powerful than a failed king. And far more powerful too than the Legislative Assembly. The Girondins scrambled to reclaim some measure of control over the situation. Virginor and Brissot ordered a delegation of 20 to be dispatched to the palace to organise a ceasefire. As this delegation left the menage, they narrowly avoided a horde of sans that rushed straight for the hall's large doors. To save their own skin, the delegation broke up, preferring not to warn their colleagues of the impending danger. The mob's intention was to target the Legislative Assembly and occupy their attention while the insurrectionaries elsewhere in Paris solidified control for the insurrectionary commune. The Assembly heard the mob before they saw them. From inside, the shouts and chants of the mob were becoming increasingly audible. A few Girondins took chairs, tables, furniture of all sorts and attempted to form an ad hoc blockade at the door. Virginaud led the defence, physically holding the door shut. But just like a sandcastle can't hold back the tide, the delegates couldn't hold back a furious wave of pissed off Parisians. Whatever bravery and bravado had compelled the Girondins to resist melted away immediately as hundreds rushed into the hall, brandishing their spears and waving red and blue flags. The delegates were now falling over themselves to profess their loyalty to the people in the revolution. A roll was then called with the names of all the assembled delegates, and one by one they filed past the president's podium, reiterating their oaths of loyalty. A single partition wall separated the royal family from the mob, which now occupied the main hall. Fortunately for them, and it's really an open question as to why, the Sonculo seemed uninterested, or at least preoccupied with giving the delegates the fright of their lives. Elsewhere, the Swiss were still heavily engaged. As the fighting at the Tuileries wore on, the Sonculo gained the upper hand, clawing their way to victory one staircase, one room, one barricade at a time. They were simply too many, and the Swiss were hard pressed from all sides. It was not for lack of bravery that the Swiss eventually fell, but rather for lack of ammunition. Their musket fire faded away as the last shots were expended, allowing more and more of the attackers to stream into the palace. The first unlucky few who reached the palace itself might have been torn apart, but droves upon droves of others rushed inside soon after, taking advantage of any breach in the palace defences. Taking advantage of any breach in the palace defences. Room to room, hallway to hallway, the bloody, desperate struggle continued. Despite no hope of relief, the Swiss still fought on, but they could not expect to last long. Those not killed outright in the fighting were lynched on the spot, bayoneted as they lay wounded on the ground. Those lucky enough to have hidden away inside the palace were sniffed out over the next few hours and murdered on the spot. It was a massacre. Over 500 of the Swiss Guard lay dead, the rest either captured, fled or injured. Around 60 officers and men were all that remained, taken prisoner and escorted away from the palace. Occasionally, a man was picked off by the mob and strung up all alone turn or perhaps bayoneted and then mutilated. After some hours of this, they were delivered into the custody of the insurrectionary commune at the Hôtel de Ville. Its large spacious front courtyard was opened up to allow the entry of the mob bearing the prisoners. To what extent the commune actually controlled what happened to the prisoners is doubtful. And it's possible, even if they had wanted to, that they could not have prevented what happened next. Swiss guards were taken in groups to be hanged at the gallows set up in the courtyard usually used for executing common criminals, now used to hang criminals of a different type. Others were lined up and shot before the hangman could have his go. Officers attempted in vain to stop the slaughter, but were silenced. And all the while, the massive crowd of cheering onlookers applauded each and every violent execution, taking trophies and trinkets from the dead guardsmen. A lock of hair, a handkerchief dipped in blood, a ragged strip of the Swiss scarlet uniform. In the end, only a handful of officers were spared, including Major von Barkman himself. Their reckoning would come later. For the better part of the day, the royal family had been confined to their cramped writer's room in the menage. As the day drew to a close, they were escorted from their hideaway to a fortified temple on the city outskirts. The next day, the Legislative Assembly resumed its debates, business as usual. But in that time, the insurrectionary commune had not been idle. Now was their chance to deliver the coup de grace. To translate the Great Journée of August 10th into political capital, the Commune directed their Jacobin allies in the Assembly to put forth a decree that would officially demote the King and install a small executive council to take emergency control. To guarantee that the debates were in favour of the decree, the Commune organised for large parties of sans to enter into the public viewing sections of the menage. Ostensibly there to merely observe and inspect the day's debates 
the real purpose was to intimidate the Girondins into supporting the Jacobins. Thus, the coup d'état that followed in the immediate aftermath of the insurrection. Thus, the coup d'état that followed in the immediate aftermath of the insurrection of August 10th was not delivered at sword point over the mangled body of the king and his ministers, as many revolutionaries might have hoped. Rather, the coup was ratified by an earnest, if ultimately predetermined, debate that was conducted through August 11th and 12th. And it was from the little writer's room that Louis listened to these debates, personally privy to the discussions that determined exactly how, not if, his reign would end. An interim government would be established, its members to be decided by election. Active and passive citizenship was effectively neutralised by the institution of universal manhood suffrage. Moreover, a new constitution would be drawn up, confirmed by a national vote. And of course, the various powers and prerogatives vested in Louis were immediately and unconditionally suspended. No more suspensive veto. No more say in ministerial, diplomatic or military appointments. No power, just rank and title, stripped of that final veneer of regal legitimacy. His weakness laid bare. By a near-unanimous vote of the Legislative Assembly, Louis was to be arrested and held in the Hôtel de Luxembourg. But then, a last-minute decision on the night of August 12th determined that Louis would not be incarcerated in the sumptuous comfort of the Hôtel, but instead would remain in the cold confines of the Temple, under the watchful eye of the Revolutionary Guard. And that was that. With scarcely a peep raised in protest, the reign of Louis XVI, of the noble house of Bourbon, king of the French and descendant of Hugh Capet, came to an effective end. And with the end of his reign, so too ended the grand constitutional compromise achieved between the crown and the people. The constitution of 1791 was dead, dying right alongside the monarchy. Though nominally Louis was still head of state, the crown was essentially defunct. I'm quite sure that the royal family, within the thick walls of the temple, took stock of their situation and found their prospects to be dim indeed. What the future held in store for them was anyone's guess. But at least for now, they were alive and together. But like Flotsam tossed about in a great maelstrom, Louis, Marie Antoinette, Marie Theresa, and the Dauphin were not to be together for very much longer. Their days were numbered. The insurrection of August 10th was quite a bit different than those spontaneous, explosive outbursts of revolutionary energy that we've seen interspersed throughout the revolution so far. From the tennis court oath to the day of the market women, the fall of the Bastille and the occupation of the Tuileries all had occurred when the pent-up anger, dissatisfaction and ire of the people built to critical mass and then exploded out. There had only been two times where the sans-culottes and the forces of revolution were coordinated and led in any direct sense. Once during the Champ de Mars protest, and once during the Journée of June 20th. The August insurrection differed from all prior upheavals. Where the others were decentralized, loosely coordinated, the insurrection was directed from on high by a central committee. Others were ad hoc, fairly spontaneous, reliant more upon the spur of the moment action than committed, predetermined organization. By comparison, the insurrection was the result of months of planning and preparation. And where before the rising of the Parisians had been performative, symbolic even, the insurrection was not mired in the pretense of spectacle. Its purpose was direct and incisive, to overthrow the constitutional order and seize power. And it had been an incredible success. Out of all the political upsets, popular uprisings and violent crescendos, the insurrection of August 10th stands out amongst all as being the point at which the revolution had irrevocably descended into uncharted political waters. The world's first popular revolution. So we can put an absolute bookend on the political revolution. The social revolution was here. The question now was what would come next? With a new constitution came an opportunity to clear house, to fully eradicate the monarchy by inaugurating a republic, and in so doing, institutionalize the social revolution. This was a chance for the insurrectionary turning point to mean real change. So buckle up, ready for the next phase of the revolution.